Hello everybody, welcome to the next African Composers interview. We have a guest composer with us today speaking to us from South Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Anybody who is watching us live and anybody who will watch this later as a recorded interview, we appreciate your interest and your support. Thank you. Uh, now let's go straight into the rest of the interview. So to our guest composer of today, first of all, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. As fine as possible in these strange times, but, but all good on the side in Johannesburg. Okay, good. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. So please introduce yourself to us. Okay, so I'm Cara Stacey. <clears throat> I'm a South African musician and composer, academic. Um, I guess I, well, I grew up in Swaziland, which is now called Eswatini, a small Southern African country. Um, so I guess I considered myself a little bit more Swazi than South African, but I, I came back to South Africa uh, to study music in Cape Town at the South African College of Music. Um, so my background is kind of a classical background initially, performance, composition, musicology, um, but I became interested in uh, indigenous Southern African instruments as a performer. Um, and so I, yeah, I had my studies at, at UCT. I studied with a bunch of really great people, composers and uh, performers. Uh, probably most important for me, apart from my classical piano studies, uh, was Dizu Plikis, who was my teacher on African instruments. Um, and I went on, I did a master's in musicology in Edinburgh, and then a master's in performance at SOAS in London. Um, but as time was going on, I was just getting more and more interested in African indigenous instruments, specifically Southern African musical bows. Um, so yeah, I studied and made music in a variety of different contexts. I was always interested in composing, um, but then I became also quite interested in improvising as well, always trying to think about where these indigenous instruments, these musical bows that I was playing. Hello, we seem to have lost our guest for a few seconds. Let's try to resolve the issue. Give us a minute, please. Thank you. So our guest said she's going to um, connect her phone. I think there was a technical issue at her end, but we'll find out, we'll see what's going on. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, don't forget, you can drop your questions and comments here in the comments section. Thank you. Hello, welcome. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think there was we a have, a, in South Africa, we have a load shedding. And this weekend, which is yeah, so this weekend, which is a particularly cold weekend, we were told that power would cut, but they have schedules for it, and they've completely gone against the schedule. So, but I'm back. I'm back. Thank you. I don't really remember the last sentence you you uttered. So, if you don't mind starting from where you can remember that you stopped. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I was talking about how I've always been interested in how these Southern African indigenous instruments fit into different contexts, probably. Um, so as time has gone on, I've worked with a lot of different types of musicians, electronic musicians, um, <clears throat> composers, uh, scored composers from a more kind of traditional classical background, um, and then people 
improvisers, people who play a whole lot of different instruments. When I was in London at SOAS, I played with a lot of people who played other instruments, traditional instruments from other parts of the world. Um, so, so yeah, I was just kind of testing out um, what these instruments that I was playing, what they could do, um, and yeah, how how to challenge myself as a player as well by by asking people to write for me or to putting myself in situations where I was writing for let's say string quartet plus umhube mouth bow and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I went on in 2013. I started my PhD at UCT uh, in Cape Town, um, and it was a joint PhD uh, grant, so I could do half of it at the University of Cape Town and then half at SOAS in London. And while I was there, um, yeah, I, basically the topic of my PhD was to go back. My my kind of research focus meant that I went back to Eswatini, Swaziland, and um, I was working with people who played the Makwana musical bow. So it's a it's a really tall musical bow with a good resonator. And I was looking at how people were being innovative on that instrument and how they were creating new music. Um, I was mostly working with elderly players who played, had been playing their whole lives. Uh, but I was really interested in how they think about composing and how they, um, what they see as the kind of parameters of that musical style and that way of making music, and then how they break those down in their own individual ways. And part of that meant that I was experimenting with composing as like a research tool in that space um, with mixed results, some, some interesting results, some less successful results. But um, so yeah, I guess from, from an ethnomusicological perspective or musicological perspective, I'm interested in how composing can feed into research contexts. And I guess it's just an alignment of all my interests, which cross between research, playing, improvising, and composing. Um, yeah, I finished my PhD in 2017. Um, and then since then, I've just been involved with a lot of different, different types of ensembles, different types of recording projects. I've put out a few albums, um, each time using those instruments as the kind of generative seed from which everything else uh, came out, but also collaborating with a lot of different types of composers as well. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Anybody who looks up our guest composer of today on, online will quickly discover that, yes, she's absolutely interested in improvisation and experimentation. We'll talk about those later. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, you talked about going to Eswatini um, to conduct your research. Uh, when we talk about European music, so let's look at European music for an, as an example. If somebody wants to compose European music, they don't need to go to Europe. I don't think people do that. Of course, maybe they listen to a lot of European music to gain some um, skills, knowledge. Why did you have to go to Eswatini? Could it be that not enough of what is happening there has become mainstream, globally recognized? Is that what fed that? For certain, for certain. It's, it's very much, as much as within African music research, this kind of approach is not favored. It's quite a colonial kind of perspective. But the reality is that there are so few players of that instrument left. They're, they're like two different recording projects from the past 30 years of that kind of music. There's almost no knowledge even in that country about what, how to play that instrument, how to compose on that instrument, what to do with it. Or, um, so it was a little bit, I didn't really want to replicate all of these colonial scholarly models, but at the same time, I literally needed to go to the rural areas to go and be with older players because nobody else, no one in town knew, knew what they were doing or how they were doing it or very few people. So yeah, there's just that kind of music is just not readily available at all. And especially not the kind of, not information or the kind of voices and opinions of those composers. So I was quite interested, you know, when people do that kind of research, they often paint those types of players, players of indigenous instruments in the rural areas, elderly players, as quite static people who are maintaining a tradition. Um, not They don't really see them, or they're not often painted as like innovative artists, contemporary artists. You know, there's all sorts of reasons 
for that. But I kind of wanted to break that down because I was finding the people that I was working with who were teaching me were kind of 90 years old, 88 years old, and still were like teaching themselves new instruments, creating new music continually, like really pushing themselves artistically. So, and I guess that's how I felt, how I related to that instrument and how I related to how, using those types of instruments in other spaces, just trying to push myself continually, take experiment, sometimes it didn't work, sometimes it did. Um, and I was I was finding a lot of similarities in some ways with the players who were 60 years older than me, doing, you know, had lived a very different kind of life to me. Um, so yeah, so that's why that's why I went and did that. I grew up in that country, so it, it was already quite familiar to me. Um, not all of them, I'd met so many different people, but not all of them. Um, but I lived in a kind of peri-rural place when I grew up, so it wasn't very, it wasn't super um, unfamiliar. Okay. It was in other ways, but also in some ways it was it was more familiar to me than I had grown up in Johannesburg, for instance. Okay, can you give us just some examples of what 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 um, worked well and what did not quite work out so well, please? So, my initially my idea was to what I found was that a lot of these musicians kind of generated their own personal style of playing and composing um, because they had because they've been so few players for for the last hundred years or so. So even when they were young, there were very few people to learn from. So they kind of there was there was immediately an emphasis on creating your own music, composing your own music, and and everyone was quite isolated from each other. Like they they've met a couple of times for ensemble stuff, but most of the time they've been apart from each other. So everybody had their own quite particular musical style of composing, and I kind of my idea was that I would study with these teachers, and then I would try to compose in the way that they were teaching me. And then I would play it back to them as like a feedback tool and see what they thought. Because a lot of stuff wasn't very articul clearly articulated, like, uh, you know, a certain type of rhythm being favored or a certain way of using the harmonics and, you know, for one person's style. But it, people wouldn't necessarily talk about their composing in that way. So I was trying to find nonverbal ways of like experimenting. So I created some songs and some little sketches of songs and I played them back to people. But in a couple of the cases, because of like age, gender and race issues and class issues, um, often I got just a generic positive response because I had composed something in that style. So, so I didn't necessarily get constructive uh, feedback. I was just getting positive. The white girl did something good for her. Well, um, can I come in there if you don't mind? Uh I'm not trying to question what you, you know, the impression you got, because you were there, I was not. But are you certain that it's not a case of that what you composed was was what they were expecting or was good, and they just gave you the feedback that they were supposed to, based on the work? A couple, I think a couple of times that was the case, but then just knowing the musical styles a bit better of particular musicians, I think they were just being a little polite. But 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 so what I ended up doing is that I modified my my strategy, which was we agreed to compose together, and that was much more helpful because we everyone came up with little sketches and we together we made compositions where where someone would then feel a little bit more comfortable to say okay actually that's nice but let's do it like this or I prefer that the structure was a little bit like this uh, or those lyrics are nice but let's let's do something else or, I, or, or it was kind of more communal composing and I think that was there was a lot more that was useful and constructive that came out of that because then I could tell what was good and what wasn't so but overall I mean my overall approach with these things because I come from a practice based research background is that you know people when you're doing that kind of work people are continually putting themselves out there um, you know, playing their music for you, playing their, their composition, composing for you and around you. And it, and it can be quite, I don't know, you can feel quite um, subconscious or, or kind of you, you're making yourself quite vulnerable to this person who's just arrived into your life. Mm -hmm. So it was really nice to balance that out by me also singing something that I thought maybe was good, maybe wasn't, and getting feedback from that and just kind of 
participating, basically. Mm. There is a topic that um, I guess is a bit of a shaky one and some may prefer to avoid, but because you used the expression colonization, colonialism earlier, I thought if we can just address that very quickly. Uh, your country is a very interesting one. Many African countries are becoming more so um, physically mixed rather than just mixed um, based on tribe. Uh, but your country is one of those that you know is recognizably a very mixed country when it comes to the physical attributes of people. Do you think, again, I'm not trying to tell people to stop doing what they do, but do you think this will get to a point where you will not be um, the outsider coming in because you are an insider going in just to a different part of the inside, you know? Uh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. There are people who will see someone like you doing research, walking into a space, looking at old videos, the response from a lot of people of some people is, oh, is these foreigners? They went to our great grandfather's villages to record the music. And you seem to be living through that. But it's mm -hmm. not based on fact because you are from the country. I think it's going to get to a point, do you think, ever? Or is that pointless to look at, look out for? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, Southern Africa obviously is very shaped, or at least the excluding uh, Mozambique, Angola. You know the rest of southern africa is so defined by south african history in particular and like the racist history of apartheid in south africa so it's it's the legacy is so long so i think it's really is going to be a really long time before we reach that point but in some ways i don't i think it's especially doing that kind of research that i was doing and making music in that kind of way and also as a musician and a composer using these instruments i'm also a pianist i use piano a lot but I, I kind of mixed it up between the two it's quite good to feel a little uncomfortable about it I think to feel like we have to consider this these dynamics um, consciously in everything that we do I think that's a better position especially for white South Africans and and to be honest it's one that not many white South Africans even pay attention to so you know, it's, it's good to kind of keep that as a m main message. I, I often feel uncomfortable or feel question what I do or, or I have to be more rigorous. Um, and when I take chances or I like I have to just be a little bit more conscious about these things because of that that dynamic. But 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 in the end, if your work is ethical um, and if you use your platform and your privilege, which white South Africans today still have a massive amount of privilege, compared to any of our other countrymen. Um, if you use that in a way that, or if you're aware of it and you use it to also uplift other voices, I think that's been something that I've tried to integrate as much as possible into my work, especially with indigenous instrument players, because there's so many older players, even in South Africa, not just Eswatini. There's so, there's so many older players who kind of Maybe they're just like recently Mantombi, Matotiana. She basically just released her first solo album just recently. You know, they, it doesn't, it's not just about that because she is a master musician who is it's like one of the reasons I even play that Mukube instrument. But it's a kind of, you have to, you have to still engage with your work, still do the things that you want to do, but try to do them in the best way possible that allows for these other voices to be louder than yours. And okay. It's completely, I mean, I've had a, a great time. I've had tons of amazing opportunities. And I've had this really amazing the privilege of these great relationships with these older musicians. And there, they're of course, are race dynamics. But another part of it is just that they live in a different way. They live in the rural areas. You know, they live with a lot less money than I do. They are, they've learned to play and to think about music in a totally different way. So I've had such a privilege of being able to engage with that and learn from them. And that's something that even in, in Eswatini, a lot of people who live in town haven't been able to have access to as well. So, yeah, just try to uplift those voices, but also just be cognizant of the fact that the, these race dynamics and class dynamics in South Africa, are, they're very entrenched. And we have to be a bit uncomfortable as like South Africans, whether we're musicians, composers, researchers, or anyone actually. Um, it's a constructive place. I don't feel like, I don't, I think it's a constructive, useful kind of place to sit. 
Okay. I think it will be a privilege for anybody, you know, to get involved in that kind of work. Um, any African, anybody at all, whatever your hair, your hue, your skin color. I think you know, if I get the opportunity, I think it will be a privilege for everyone. And um, I don't want to dwell too much on that point, but I'm almost certain there are those who will hear the expression privilege and that certain South Africans, because of their skin colors, have no privilege. And they will say, oh, but look at that video. Look at these people. Look at what's happening here and there. That's not exactly universal across South Africa. I don't want to do too much on that, but I think I'm, if it's okay with you, I'll just probably raise that very quickly because I have okay. seen a lot of that online. People constantly saying, what privilege because of my skin color. My life in South Africa is terrible. Or oh, this is even happening globally. Yeah. I don't want to go into the details. <laughs> because there are people who will say, yes, you may be poor, but your skin color opens doors. So that's the definition of privilege. Listen, this is not what this forum is for. But if you want to add something, I will not, I will not tell you not to add what you want to add. And then we can move on to the musical side of the conversation. No, I mean, it's really, it's really important. I think especially, I mean, it's really important. It's really important in the kind of work that I do, my ethnomusicological work. It's really important because there's a history of a certain dynamic, which we have to, you know, I look back at record, historic recordings that were made in Swaziland, in Eswatini, in the 60s and 70s. Absolutely beautiful recordings. Overall, generally, a, a very solid researcher did that work. But at the same time, there, there are lots of issues that, you know, trying to find out who some of the musicians were who were featured in those recordings super difficult there are lots of unanswered questions about that archive so already in my own phd research i was just kind of hitting a wall all the time when when looking at this older generation very thorough but still i mean all his work happened during the apartheid era so of course that has some kind of that shapes the kind of work that he does you know or did rather but it's it's about nuance because there's just so, there's so much that's also useful and interesting that came out of that so that's that, that's quite a tricky thing. But I mean, if you look back at the history of ethnomusicological work in Southern Africa, it's just old white guys. It's exhausting. It's really, even as a young white woman, it's exhausting to have to face that continually. And when I mean, you're teaching, to have to, to to get people to try to critically look at those texts and also see what what's useful about them and see because sometimes that is the evidence that we have from the time for those instruments for that kind of music but also to engage with it critically, it's tricky. But I mean, overall, I mean, you know, South Africa has massive problems. Just now with COVID, we're just seeing all of these issues to do with like identity and class and privilege are all kind of manifesting in a way, even during COVID where, where this, you know, overall it seems that the disease doesn't discriminate. But I mean, in such a divided society, we have so much evidence of how divided we actually are and how wealthy people live a very 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 different life to everybody else okay um thanks for addressing that point and i was going to ask you about taking the names and identifying the musicians and the effort you're putting in there but clearly because of past history you are putting in that kind of effort to make sure they are identified that's absolutely um interesting to note let's go back again um to the beginning of the conversation so when you started out composing, did you have any detractors? Did anybody say, don't bother, this is not a good career path? Or how did how was it for you early, during the early stages? So I, I, I guess I probably started composing in high school. Um, I had a really wonderful Bulgarian teacher who's a piano teacher and also taught me. And she was she's a very avid composer. So. I got a lot of encouragement from her. So actually when I applied to UCT to study, I just thought, oh, I'll be a composer. Great, <laughs> that sounds interesting, I'll just do that. Um, once I got there, I found the environment quite different. I've been, you know, growing up outside of South Africa and then coming back to it is quite a culture shock. Um, and I had lessons, I was a little bit confused at first whether my focus should be, I, it started off as composition, but then I, I got very interested in musicological issues and African music uh, studies. So I kind of changed direction a little bit. I had lessons with Peter Klatso at that time uh, during my, my undergrad degree. And then when I went on to Edinburgh, I kind of, I was definitely performing more. I wasn't 
looking at um, composition very seriously. But but as time has gone on, kind of because of these instruments that I play, opportunities kind of popped up. So I, I feel like I lack a formal training, even though I did do these courses during my undergrad and during my master's in London. Um, I always feel like I'm kind of missing a formal training in that more traditional classical sense. But at the same time, I'm making, I've done quite a lot of electronic music work and a charismatic composition and film sound stuff. I think my diverse interests have meant that I've been forced into the, the deep end of a lot of compositional spaces and then had to like learn how to do something. Um, and, a, and a little bit because of my diverse musical in interests, I think, um, yeah, I don't feel particularly held back by that traditional way of studying composition. And it, and it may mean that I'm a little bit messy and I'm not... Um, creative. Skilled. Creative, <laughs> innovative, and creative. But um, yeah, I just really enjoy. I enjoy that feeling of just not really knowing necessarily how I'm going to do something, and then bringing together all my past experiences and just solving the creative problem, or not problem, but the task. Mm -hmm. um, and it's meant that I've yeah, basically my approach is generally just say yes to everything, say yes to every scary thing that arrives on my doorstep, <laughs> and then see what happens. Um, but, sorry, I was saying I was going to say you have been successful, you know, at what you do. Whether you've had the training or not, you've been absolutely successful. Again, like I said to everyone watching, just go online, look up our guest composer of today. You will find that she's performed quite a lot, created quite a lot, and she does a lot of collaborating as well, which is something we are going to touch upon. But before we do that. Let's look at the kinds of instruments you compose for. You've composed for a wide variety of instruments. Which one has been the most challenging? Hmm. Uh, it might it might be a strange answer, but I think probably the musical bows I play are the most challenging to compose for because you know, you know certain repertoire and you know things you're comfortable with playing as a performer. So there isn't a whole lot of infrastructure in terms of really pushing yourself compositionally on the instruments. So that's kind of always something that I find every time I'm trying to create something new, I'm trying to not fall back on patterns that I've used before or, or things that feel physically easier to do on the instruments. So, so probably those. I wrote I wrote a saxophone quartet last year, which was challenging because it was also more of a kind of a different way of composing, scored composing, and a uh, kind of different approach to what I usually use. Um, I think each time it can be a little bit difficult if you're not familiar with the instrument. Like writing for organ, super difficult for me <laughs> because I don't play organ and. Um, I, it's so technical and there's so many things to learn about the instrument. Um, so I'm not sure I did that very well. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I embraced every part of what that instrument can do in order to make a piece of music. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I just go back to the musical bows, especially umhube, the mouth bow, because you use all these harmonics, uh, because you only have two fundamental tones to use to create music. And because there's certain ways of playing that you know get a good sound, so you you don't want to just always rely on those things. So it can be quite difficult to to create something really, really creative, like really beyond what's been heard before on that instrument. Or yeah, does uh, being a performer does it make a composer a better composer? Because you've just talked about some of the challenges you faced and making decisions about which instruments are more difficult to compose for. You don't know much about the organ, so composing for the organ is a bit of a challenge. So being a performer, I know you perform a lot. Does it make you more um, empathetic, more understanding as a composer when you write for others? Hmm. I, I don't think so because, I mean, I just know a lot of other very brilliant composers who do so well and aren't primarily performers at all. Um, you know, they're very diligent about doing research into new instruments and then are very skilled at being able to, to, to create new things that sound really amazing. Um, so it's probably just my messiness and my DIY approach that, that means that that's more difficult for me. Um, 
and also I think a lot of the composers I know kind of specialize, they have, you know, they've written a lot for certain instruments and they specialize in that. And you can really feel the comfort, um, the comfort that comes from being familiar with the instruments in their work. So not necessarily. Give her a second, please. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I feel I like to interact with other musicians and I like also to know the feeling of performing something, you know, in your body, how it feels to kind of recreate music and, and interact with people and be, um, I don't know, it's that kind of interaction between players. And that magical thing that happens when you create music together, whether it's your own composed music or it's somebody else's piece, when it gets in your bones and it's very comfortable for you. Um, so that really works for me. Okay. Um, I couldn't really imagine the composer who writes music and doesn't perform. Right. We're having a bit of problem with the sound, but we are going to soldier on and hopefully things will improve soon. Let's let's look at the, the mouth bow. I think it's called the South African bow. Feel free to correct me. What draws you to that instrument? To the mouth bow, sorry? Yeah. Yes, to the mouth bow. Um, it's really difficult to play. I think that's that was <laughs> that um kind of drew me to it at first. Um, there were all these things kind of unspoken about it that I had to kind of embrace and um, work out for myself as well. A lot of it is about your body and your throat and your mouth and experimenting and finding sounds for yourself. Um, I heard, I first was taught by Dizu Kaikis. I had already, I, I had, when I was a child, I had a tape that had uh, the sound of the instrument, so I kind of knew it already. Um, I didn't really understand how it worked. But then when I got to university and I heard Dizu play, he's a really brilliant uh, player. Um, it's just the harmonics, they're so subtle and they're so beautiful. Um, I just really love the sound of the instrument. I think it's very, it's quite versatile. It works really well in like acoustic and electronic spaces, as well as when Marusini plays and when Tumbi plays. So it's kind of, there's a lot that you can do with it. And I think it's a really rich kind of sound. So I'm always drawn to that. Okay. So you've worked on some projects um, during the lockdown. So anybody who is listening, we have African composers who are actively creating even during the lockdown. Um, and the new trio, The Texture of Silence, was premiered a few days ago. Well done to you and the team. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, what was your experience of working during a lockdown, which is probably the first time for you and probably the first time for most people? How has the pandemic, the lockdown affected your process, if at all? And tell us the whole story of working during a lockdown. Thank you. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty difficult, pretty strange. Um, we set ourselves with this project, there was the opportunity to be a part of our virtual national arts festival here in South Africa. And it, it was three of us, myself, a jazz guitarist called Keenan Arons and a, a visual artist called Nzwandile Putelezi. And we decided, we'd all kind of spoken independently about working together. So I saw this as a kind of opportunity to bring the three of us together. Um, I like that Keenan is from a jazz background. Um, and Mzwandile is very, he's worked a lot. He's done a lot of album artwork. So he's worked a lot with um, uh, music just in general. He's a very musical person. Anyway, he's, he's played and performed and created artworks. Um, to do with a lot of jazz musicians work as well. So uh, he's collaborated with a lot of jazz musicians. So I like this idea that we were all three of us coming from quite different backgrounds, different tools. Um, and then we were all interested in composing and improvising and everything in between. So the task was that for the three of us that we would each compose something fixed and we would um, also improvise or do uh, or have a kind of graphic score as a way of playing uh, together, kind of have a mix of different things all together, bring them all together. Kind of because I'm questioning the different natures of composing and improvising or like instant composition in that way. Um, so yeah, that was the idea. It was interesting for me as well because Keenan composes his own instrument for his jazz trio and quintet. So he had the challenge of writing for my instruments, which meant that he had to understand how they work. It was his first time doing that. 
Um, so that, and then for me, it was like having someone who usually writes with the jazz language look at the Mika Nyungwe Nyungwe play and compose something scored for that. Um, and yeah, so it was kind of, it was just a little bit of an experiment. Um, and I think it had, it overall had a good result. I think we want to just keep working with that trio to see how far we can take these performance or performative conversations about composing things that are pre-prepared and things that are instant responses to things creatively as well. Okay. Uh, so it's clear to anybody listening that collaboration plays um, a major part in what you do. How do you decide on who to collaborate with? You've given some examples of things that I guess drew you to the people that you worked with during this project or on this project. How do you decide in case anybody is watching now and is thinking, oh, I'd like to collaborate with her, I've listened to what she did here, um, I'd like to work on something similar. How do you decide, what's the criteria for you? I think I don't, I'm not sure if I have criteria. I think it's, it's often it's people whose work I like and I, I and, they can come from any kind of background or any kind of lang creative language. Um, also, it's usually, it tends to be people who are just in my scene. So I worked a lot with uh, what was called the Shard Ensemble, the Nightlight Collective, when I lived in Cape Town, a whole lot of different composers and players and improvisers. And then for quite a few years, we were just making music together for each other. And that's been a kind of backbone for the past, like, I don't know, quite a few years now. Um, but they were also my scene. I was around those people all the time. We were consuming, we were at gigs together. We were doing, I don't know, we were kind of a creative collective of some kind. Um, and here in Joburg, I've moved away from that because I'm in a different city now. Um, but there are a lot, you know, Zwandile and Keenan are in my scene here. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's also, it's like who's around me and who's doing creative things that I'm really interested in. in. Um, but then also who's just around me at any point in time. I kind of, I really value these kind of creative communities of people who are doing different types of things. Could be high level, um, could be just small scale projects. Uh, but I really like, I think those are the things that I worry after COVID might be a bit damaged. It's those kinds of communities that I think are, are so priceless in any urban or rural space. Um, but I, I worry about their survival, but because so much of my work has come from that kind of space. Now that we have the internet um, encouraging us to engage from different parts of the world, there you are in South Africa and I'm here sitting in the United Kingdom at the moment. I guess you can collaborate across the globe with different people or even across Africa people who are not in your space, as you put it. So. I'm not inviting people on your behalf, but I suppose if anybody wants to contact our composer, <laughs> she's she does collaborate a lot. She works on a lot of interesting experimental music, and um, I think you'd be interested to find out more about her. And can they feel free to reach out to you with ideas for collaborating across the world, across Africa? Well, okay. I work. Uh, I work with. A, I'm in a geo project with an Indian drummer who's based in the UK. My first album was a whole of musicians in the UK, and I've worked a lot with other South African musicians. I'd definitely be keen to connect with other people further north in Africa, for certain, because we're quite, in Southern Africa, we tend to be quite cut off from creative scenes in other African countries, so for certain. Okay, just one very quick question on collaboration. Um, which collaboration has surprised you? Which one did you work on that made you think, what just happened? <laughs> Um, I think, so my second album was a completely improvised project with a Peruvian musician called Camilo Angeles. I met him on a residency in New York and um, he's a really brilliant flute player and also a very brilliant composer, beautiful, amazing composer. And um, we, he came, we did a bunch of gigs together. He came to South Africa and we played together and we, we ended up recording something very quickly. Like we just, we took, the money that we had, which was not very much at that point, we booked studio time for like two, three hours. And then we just went in and improvised and like made this album. <laughs> I definitely, when I listened back to it, thought, oh my gosh, what have we done? <laughs> um, 
very surprising, but very uh, rewarding and totally like completely freely improvised. So there's some, even now when I listen back to the album, there's some moments that are so beautiful and some that are so challenging. And um, that was definitely one of those collaborations where very, very special, but quite out there. Okay. <laughs> um, you, in, you improvise a lot. What does it actually mean to improvise? If I say somebody improvises in music, what does that mean? I think it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, even just within completely free improvisation, where you just sit down with someone on an instrument you're familiar with or not familiar with at all and make sounds together. Even within that kind of sound space, there are lots of different schools of thought about how to do it. Um, and then obviously there's jazz and the other types of, in, uh, of music that are, have largely improvisatory natures. Um, for me, even if it can end up sounding quite atonal or there are tuning clashes between different instruments or, um, you know, it's, it's tended in South Africa, people see it as very avant-garde and kind of experimental, even though some of our most important jazz musicians went to the UK, brought that kind of music. It was seen as like a political, radical way of music. Um, I, I, like, I like it in educational context. I like it in my own playing. I like it as a way of, if you collaborate with someone and you're not sure what kind of musical background they have or, or uh, what musical interests they have, you can sit down not knowing what the results will be and just make sounds together. Sometimes it can be challenging to listen to, but I think especially in Southern Africa, you know, having an education training as part of that privileged conversation that, that we spoke about before, I think it's really, it has a lot of potential um, here where we all have lots of different varying levels of experience with different instruments, with different ways of making music. Um, so I, I also, even as a teacher, I like to use it quite a bit to bring people together and just think about sound, elements of sound, in a more abstract way and, and feel a little bit less, not feel inhibited, feel a little bit more open. With my experience of my classical training was kind of the opposite of that. Having to be quite strong and defensive you know, and very unsure of your ability compared to other people. It was such an ego continually. Whereas I think free improvisation can be like that, but in the best case scenario, it actually isn't at all. It's just an approach to making sound Okay, um, is it correct to say that when it comes to improvisation, anything can be a musical instrument? And if that is the case, what did you and your colleague use in New York? <laughs> yeah, that is true. And there are a whole lot of people I know who are so playful and, and kind of use their voices, even if they aren't singers, or sit down on instruments they've never touched before and play you know, that can be challenging for audiences to listen to. And I do understand that people, you know, find that a bit difficult. Uh, in the case of my friend Camilo and myself, he's a really brilliant, brilliant flute player, possibly one of the best I've ever heard. Um, so he was playing around with ocarinas and his flute. He's a master musician. So so it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as avant-garde as we were just exchanging instruments or playing, tapping on the table or something like that. Um, and I was playing piano and playing uh, Nyungwe Nyungwe, Dongo from Uganda, and Mafpo as well. So, so they were all they were instruments we were familiar with anyway. So I hope that it comes across as masterful in that way. But I mean, I know a lot of players, free players, who just. They're, they're, it's about sound. It isn't about how good you are on your instrument necessarily. Okay. Um, you recently joined the Northwest University School of Music and Conservatory as a senior lecturer in African music. So first of all, congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, are you? How do? How do you work this out? Do you start now over the internet? Do you wait until things resume in a more physical, tangible form? So I started last week. It's very strange beginning to to a post. Um, so everything everything at the moment is online, and it looks like for the next couple of months it will be online as well. So I think from what I can, there's a lot of blended learning in that at that university anyway. Um, and and from what I see, people are doing a lot of like video digital content for for students. So I think 
it will be challenging for the practical components like ensemble work and learning instruments and that kind of thing. So we have to think creatively about how to deal with that during lockdown. But um, in terms of the rest of the teaching, um, I'm not too intimidated by it because I think there's a chance to make really creative and interesting digital content that the students can access for free because of their because that's a massive issue here as well access to internet and to data. Um, but students will be able to access for free because the university has organized a platform that that means that students will be held back by that. That's very really good. Okay, congratulations again. Uh, let's look at the role title. It says senior lecturer in African music. What is your definition or what is the definition of African music? Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of a problematic term because in this, in educational context here, largely it's, it's, it's a quite a simplistic understanding of what that is because there'll be classical music, there'll be jazz, then there'll be African music when actually we are all here on this continent. Very few of us will ever go anywhere else. Uh, so what, what does that actually mean? There's, there's lots to be said about that. From my perspective, I just try and keep it, I, I think it's important, especially as South Africans, when we've been so cut off from the rest of the continent, it's really important to be very, very familiar with other types of indigenous musical forms, popular music forms, electronic music forms, classical composed musical forms. These are also important in trying to understand that Africa isn't just one thing. And African music isn't just one thing. It's so yeah. many things impossible to quantify. So um, it's difficult because in an institutional space, we're not having to deal with those limitations, those definitions that just don't work. Yeah. Um, but in my own, I'm trying to just fall back on my own music making, which means that the elements, composing with the instruments in those spaces, improvising, working with electronic music, working with school, string quartet music, all of these things are part of the massive set of complexes that, that are African and are musical. Okay. Um, what we just talked about now touched upon one of the reasons why this platform, the African Composers website, the Facebook page, the different things that I've put together, I've worked on anyway, why they exist. It's because of conversations that seem not to acknowledge the breadth of what is going on. Um, I've seen too many articles to count online that claim to talk about African composers. Um, they refer to these 10 as the best, this one as the one to listen to, the person who created, you know, who is changing the history of African music is somebody who we've never heard of before. Um, and so when I saw your job title, I thought, okay, this is somebody who is well-placed to make it clear to anybody listening, uh, African music is wider than what you think, and it's typically wider than what the internet tells you it is, because this is what I have observed. So you've already said, you know, as part of your role, you plan to, you hope to work to make sure that, that this lazy approach is not taken as the standard approach. It's going to be a bit of a challenge, though. <laughs> For, certain. For certain, because if you get into, it's, it's so difficult. You want people to be, especially when it comes to instruments, you really want certain instruments to be lifted to the same level as piano, violin, here in a South African context, because that is really, there's a whole hegemonic structure that you're dealing with. But at the same time, I would be so sad if I just thought that African music was marimbas and, I don't know, choral singing in the most limited sense, you know? I think it, it, it really, it really downplays like what actual performing professional life as a musician is outside of your university training, your school training, your lessons. Um, but I mean, if you look, I, I often find that if you look at like the art world, fashion world, uh, architecture, that people are so open to things that blur boundaries that are beyond the stereotype. And I find with music, and I might, it might just be from a Southern African perspective, but it, can be really people trying to codify all the time these very conservative ideas of what African music is. And I think part of the reason is because there's just so much, there's so, so much, even if you just think about it, within scholarship, like 
musicology or a kind of classical composers, and they were like how to even in the past few years try to make sense of all the different strands of experience that have come out. Composers from massive geographical areas. It's just impossible. Well, it's not impossible, but it just requires really a focus and diligence and care. Um, and and the problem is because of various strengths and weaknesses, the rest of the world wants to see Africa as everything that, that that they want to see it as. They're not necessarily open to listening or to taking the time to understand the nuance of all of these different political issues, artistic issues. Yeah. Yeah. So, difficult um it's difficult to navigate and and my experience of traveling in other parts of the world often you know as a white an african playing in i was breaking so many expectations um that it, it it often led to quite difficult and sometimes depressing conversations because people have expectations of this continent they really are, are reluctant to let go of. um yes, yes. You're absolutely right. I have seen that as well. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you, but you're right. Um, people have expectations, um, and when you don't meet those expectations, and they are usually very low, restricted expectations. If you turn up and you're an African, they expect you to fit into a box, and if you don't, people start to become, you know, uncomfortable with you because they think, well, you're supposed to be in that box. Why are you trying to step out of that box um, in their head? So you, you are you are right. Um, I do. I think it will be a bit of a challenge. I'm also concerned about something. Let's say you decide, you know what? I'm a lecturer talking about African music. I'm going to have a project. I'm going to pick one composer from every single African country to give a presentation. Five minutes shows the instruments they work with, some of their music. I'm concerned that there are those who will take that and still do the same thing. They will say, these are Africa's 54 composers. Yeah. Dr. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. Let's just say it's an ongoing discussion to be had. <laughs> well, so it's, and and it also, I mean, even beyond like the composers that you interviewed, you know, even within indigenous, even within musical work in Southern Africa, you know, we we tend to very few of them get the recognition and like financial support and and and, and awards and accolades that they deserve, but simultaneously. You know that someone will pop up and they're like, "This is the master." Okay, that's it. and then all of these other people who who bring that same level of mastery and, and wisdom and experience. And there's a kind of not enough space for everybody to 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 receive, you know, the kind of recognition that they deserve. It's a, it's, it's just a struggle. The, um, but the thing I think what matters, I think you've touched upon this before, is put people putting in the efforts and not choosing not to recognize that. This is not the master. This is just one composer. There are hundreds like them who may never see the limelight or see the light, in fact, may never be heard of. I think that part is really important, acknowledging that this is not the master. And it's, it's the responsibility of as many people as possible, to be honest, including the so-called masters. If you are elevated, I think you should start to ask questions. You should get on stage when you are given the microphone and the award and say something or engage with the organizers of the events. That's how I see things anyway. No, it's not an instruction to anybody <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think when you're giving, if you're put in a position, um, some call it a platform, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, actually, I'm not the exact best at this. There are hundreds that, for some odd reason, you've never heard of, maybe because of where I live. That matter where you live, as you know. Um, but again, you know, I, I really... I really congratulate you on that role, especially during a pandemic, you know, getting something like that. And I wish you the best with, with your future you know, job, with your future role. Okay. Um, so we talked about experimentation in music. Let's just quickly do that before we round up the interview. Let's talk about this. In music experimentation, is there anything like a wrong note? Now, I'm not going to go out there and start experimenting with different instruments and improvising and <laughs> making a lot of noise. <laughs> but is there anything like a wrong note? Just If you can just teach us about that experimentation. Um, I think it depends on the type of music and the, and the agreement amongst But I would say in free improvisation, in my experience of it, there there isn't. Um, there's, there's, you know, if you start worrying about that, all the other musical things that can happen don't happen necessarily. But at the same time, I mean, if you're musical, if you're a good musician, 
you're using your ears anyway. So you, you know, maybe you are matching up, you're playing with some people and maybe you are melodically following somebody else or you're leaving space so, so one person can step up um, and kind of to harmonically guide how the whole ensemble is going to go. And then at the same time, maybe harmony and kind of sense of tonality is actually not important in that moment. But actually other dynamic factors are important in that in that moment of music making. And then then there's no such thing as a wrong note in that moment. So it kind of it, it depends it depends how we're playing and it depends on your approach. It depends on the kind of contract you have with our musicians. Uh, you're going to unleash you're going to unleash some of us now. We're going to start banging on things and saying we are making music. Yeah. <laughs> I'm free now. I'm heard from you. <laughs> I'm gonna go around banging everything around saying I'm making music. <laughs> I, mean, I like that I like that I'm very grateful that, that I got to experience that kind of music making because my training was so restrictive and I was so anxious. I was unable to actually do anything. And it's quite hard to be creative. It's hard to be creative if you're anxious or you feel like you feel so held back by playing wrong notes or by it. A whole part of your musicianship cannot be free in that space. So, and I mean, that was my experience of playing classical piano. So that's that. And lots of other people don't experience it in that way. But for me, I was really glad, and it took a really long time for me to be comfortable with just the first time I ever freely improvised, I sat at the piano and actually couldn't touch anything. I just didn't make any notes. I didn't understand what this guy was trying to get me to do. It was so awkward. I didn't have any sense. I was so scared of wrong notes that I just sat there for like 10 minutes not being able to play. So it's like the way that you've been taught really affects how free you can be when you're being free. And so I think whichever way that comes out, whether it's reminding of piano concertos or I don't know, Kevin Boland's string quartet or completely free improv with a whole lot of crazy musicians or playing Timbila with a whole lot of musicians, Mozambique musicians, whatever it is, it's like feeling that being able to be free and musical. I think that's really important for me, having not experienced that for quite a few years. Okay, thank you very much for that. It's, it's good to hear, um, or rather very interesting to hear your story um, and how you've you got into improvisation. Are you concerned that when you improvise, the music may never be repeated by anybody else? Um, sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's not about that. It's, you know, that may not be the aim of, of it. Um, and but because I compose and I improvise, you know, part of my improvising, especially the piano, the piano means that I, that's how I come up with a lot of my compositional ideas. And the ones that are good tend to stick, and then I'll write them down and then I'll develop them. Um, so the ones sometimes it's nice to just know that you've made something, and sometimes it's so, so good, or it sounded really amazing, it felt really amazing, and you're never going to have it again. That's that. In, in those cases, I like to record. Um, but you won't be able to replicate those things, and sometimes the best things in life we experience twice. So it's actually fine. You just have to let it go. It's, it's a very like um, free approach, not clinging. It's kind of a Buddhist approach, You're not clinging to anything. You just experience it as it is, and then it's gone, and then you move on. So sometimes that can be good. Other times it can be frustrating when you improvise and it's so so wonderful, and then that's you, you forgot to. Record or whatever. <laughs> so it's always a mix. Mm -hmm. I suppose with the availability of technology now, many and many more um, or more and more improvisers will be recording what they do. Um, but it's interesting to hear, it's interesting to hear um, what you do and decisions that you take about what to record and what's not. So how improvising can also feed into making full compositions. Let's talk about books very quickly. You talked mm -hmm. about open, Three approaches. Betwixt actually sounds like a, an open, welcoming forum for people who create new music. I read about it briefly. How does Betwixt acquire its new music? Well, I guess I should say that it's it's been a little bit, we've had a little hiatus, so we haven't actually had any events for a while. Um, and we both moved, the, myself and Nicola Dutoy, who's the cellist who I, who I run it with, we both moved to Joburg 
Um, she had a new job and it's kind of been a little bit on ice for now, but we're hoping to start after lockdown again. Um, but I think that was a response to the fact that many venues, especially smaller venues in Cape Town when we were living there, were closing down. There wasn't a space for people to try out new things and for audiences to listen to things they weren't familiar with as well, whether they were composed or improvised or jazz or whatever they were, could have been, could have been anything. So we wanted to create a space where, where we would either we would approach artists and say, you can do anything that you wanted to do and you felt wasn't marketable or you wanted to do on stage and you, and you weren't able to find a platform for it, you can do it without experiments. Um, and that was the kind of idea behind the concert series. And it was so wonderful. I really enjoyed doing it, even though it was very stressful at times. <laughs> Um, but also, I just I just thought it was important as performers and composers to, to contribute to a scene remaining alive. That 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 there would be audiences. People came to all of our events. You know, they would come to each. The same person would come again and again and again because it was kind of you didn't have to commit to five hours of something that you might not like. It was short little sets of things that might be very challenging for you or something you'd really really like and like to hear more of. Or it would be that combination of voice. Um, just also encouraging people to listen outside of their comfort zone, which is is part of it's important for me because I make music that is often out of people <laughs> people's comfort zone. But also, you know, it brought together all my interests: indigenous instruments that don't have enough of a platform, more experimental avant-garde music that also doesn't have enough of a platform, or other musicians from jazz or classical music who who feel like they always have to play certain things in certain spaces, wanting to try something that maybe they're not so good at or they haven't tried before. So it's that kind of middle middle space that we can create and hopefully we'll carry on after the lockdown. And okay. We're about to round up the interview. Thanks for the introduction to be twixt to be, you know, we hope to hear more and more from you, the duo, and obviously from you generally. Is it okay if I just mention this here? I didn't know, I did not plan to do this, but just in case you are thinking of running an Africa wide program or I don't mm -hmm. know, in, around South Africa and beyond South Africa for African composers to do with the NWU, so your new role, teaching students, putting together a video set of slides for African composers, feel free to reach out because we do not want this information gap to continue, which is why this platform exists. We cannot allow the we cannot continue to propagate gaps, you know, in our, in Africa's history. So, if you want to, the website is there. We have a list, a growing list of African composers being added, so that the information that is being fed to students, you know, is as wide as possible and more encompassing than what the internet seems to present to people. Well, apart from the website that we've put up. <laughs> well, I mean, thank you so much for your work because I, when I did my masters in Edinburgh, I was looking at African. And I remember that, okay, it was a long time ago now, but it was really hard to find information on composers. You know, there would be a couple of big names from like Uganda, Tanzania, Nigeria, but then there was nothing in between and there, and there would just be like one or two names per country. So it's just such a valuable resource that you've brought together. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. That's really kind of you to say. So we look forward to keeping in touch and hearing from you. It's been really interesting talking to you today. Thank you to everyone who's watching. Thanks for your feedback, your comments. Um, thank you to our guest composer. It's been really, really cool talking to you. I wish you success with your future endeavors and um, look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on and uh, thank you for keeping up this work. <laughs> thank you. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.